Sarah Miller, she's principal at City Light Capital, a VC firm that invests early in impactful companies with a focus on education, safety and care, and the environment. Uh, they do uh, seed and series A investments. Um, and they only invest in companies where there's a direct relationship between financial performance and measurable social impact. Uh, they've made over 80 investments with about eight exits so far. Um, I believe the AUM is around 80 million. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Sarah, thanks. Great, thank you everybody. Thanks for, thanks for having me here. Um, so I'll, uh, Cooney just gave kind of the, the broad overview, but I'll give a little bit more detail to exactly what it is we do and how we do it. Um, so City Light's an early stage venture fund. And so we're equity only investors. Um, we're headquartered in New York City, but we'll invest anywhere across the United States. Um, and we are focused on companies at the seed and the series A stage. I'll get into a little bit more about how we think about those two different stages in a second. Um, but overarchingly, we're looking for companies operating in the education, environmental, and safety and care sectors, all very broadly defined. And so within that environmental vertical for us is anything to do with climate change, which includes food and agriculture, um, infrastructure, energy efficiency, resource conservation, anything that we can tie back to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is something that we're, we're interested in taking a look at. Um, we tend to be primarily software investors. Um, most of that just has to do with the fact that we're a relatively small fund. And so things that require a lot of capital up, up front um, tend to not be the best fits for the structure of our fund. Um, but we target 10x returns. And so we're looking for those companies that are you know, rocket ships to the moon, knowing that 90% of the portfolio likely will not make it that far so that we can uh, deliver returns to our investors based on the, the success of a handful of companies in the portfolio. Um, within the environmental vertical as well, um, I'll, I'll get a little bit more into what exactly we mean by uh, financial returns have to scale in line with impact. The way that we think about impact within our companies is that the core product or service that the company provides has to have some kind of data feedback loop embedded into it that allows us to track what its impact is in more or less real time. We take an annual snapshot to, to report to our investors um, and also to revisit some of those metrics and, and performance with the companies. But the idea is that there should be a kind of unit economic to your impact that for every additional dollar of revenue that you generate, there's an equal amount of impact being generated. In every case we go through with the company in detail, what are those metrics that they are already collecting and some that they may be capable of collecting that would be indicative of their impact. And we go through a process that we call the impact pro forma which is us taking the financial model that the company has given us. And so typically that's anywhere between a five to 10 year projection of if everything falls away that we think it will, here's what the business looks like five, 10 years from now. And we pull out the drivers of that and say, for example, if you're being paid based on the number of kilowatt hours of renewable energy that you generate, then that number of kilowatt hours of renewable energy also has a Corollary, or it can be a coefficient to how many greenhouse gases you're taking out or the tonnage of greenhouse gases that you're taking out of the atmosphere by directly replacing that dirty energy with your clean energy. And so it's given the, the very early stage of the companies that we invest in, it is kind of more of a um, more of a, a proxy for we expect this is what the carbon emissions are based on all of the research that's out there by the EPA and based on the very real auditable data that the company is collecting. Um, and then we project that out five or 10 years and say, here's what the company is gonna be capable of achieving if they do what they say they can do in their financial model based on their growth expectations, based on other monetization opportunities, that sort of thing. And then we have effectively a, a baseline to compare against for that company. When the next year comes around, the next two years comes around, um, I will, I will definitely say that there has never been a company that has come in to us and said, we beat on our revenue targets. And so we're gonna beat on our impact targets. Um, in early stage venture, if you know of those companies, please send them to me. Um, but we uh, generally, we are revisiting those projections in 
in light of, you know, revenue is not where we anticipated it being, but does that equation still hold true that for that revenue traction that you're at now, this is the impact that you should also be expected to have had. And if that, that isn't the case and that hasn't held true, then we need to go back and revisit either the metrics that we're tracking or something about the product is broken and we need to, we need to figure out how to um, reiterate on it and, and figure out you know, how to optimize for the impact of that product. Um, and so I said I would go into a little bit more about the, the seed and the Series A stages. So just from a purely logistical standpoint, our seed fund is very programmatic. Um, we write $50,000 checks to companies that I would say are post-product but pre-product market fit. Um, generally have a little bit of revenue traction but are still figuring out a, where, where that product market fit is, but from the impact side, exactly what are those data points that we should be collecting and that are proof of this product works. Um, generally, especially in the, um, in the hardware space, for example, if you don't have enough units in the field, it's hard to collect that data. Um, and so we need to, we help the companies understand based on our experience as impact investors and all the companies that we have seen, here's some of the metrics that you might consider tracking. And some of the things that you can plug in from the very beginning to that company or to, to the data component of the product that allows you to track that upfront rather than trying to build it in series B, series C and having to you know, reverse engineer every single one of your widgets that's, that's out in the field. Um, and we find that that makes for better um, not just at the seed, but also at the series A, if you're able to demonstrate with some of that data, cost savings, energy savings, um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, that actually makes for better conversations with customers, that makes for better conversations with potential employees, um, it makes for better marketing overall. And so there's an outsized impact to going through this process at the earliest stages of the business. Um, so going back to our seed portfolio, so we write 50, 000, these $50,000 checks, we write about one every two weeks. Um, and so the seed portfolio right now is about 50 companies. I think we're gonna be at 55 by the end of this week. Um, we'll probably be at 150 by the end of 2022. And so the idea of that portfolio is we're a relatively small team, but you are surrounded by 149 other CEOs who are at a similar stage to you that are working on similar problems that will be able to help with, um, with any part of the process that you might be struggling with. Most of these entrepreneurs are second time founders. And so if you need help with pricing strategy or digital marketing or whatever it is, there's a group of people within that, that community that will be able to help you where we are not acting as a bottleneck. Um, we also were very specific about the investors that we took on for that seed fund um, because it's a separate entity from the, the overall fund. Um, and it's all investors, operators, entrepreneurs, sector experts who have, who have told us that proactively they want to be helpful to companies. And so it, it, the way that we pitched it to them, of course, was you're usually making a couple of angel investments every year to the tune of $50,000, $100,000, but you only get exposure to five, 10 companies at the most. If you invest in City Light for that same amount, we're going to give you exposure to 150 companies and you can pick and choose which ones you want to work with. Um, and you can potentially follow on into any of those if you would like. We don't force that, but it's, uh, it's certainly um, on the table for them. So that's leaving the seed portfolio behind for a second. Our Series A portfolio is where the vast majority of our time, resources, and capital go. Um, it's a much more concentrated portfolio. We are actually currently in the market raising for a $100 million Series A fund. Um, we held our first close mid-August um, and we'll likely hold a second close before the end of this year. And um, for that fund, we look for companies that are at a million dollars in ARR and that already have those impact metrics predefined. And so whether or not they come to us ready with those metrics outlined, we may have a process that we go through with them for um, for three to four conversations, or maybe it's just one conversation of outlining what those metrics are to get to that final, um, the, the final impact pro forma and the impact metrics that we choose to track with them over time. Um, the, that fund is majority follow on investment. And so while two to $3 million is our initial check, um, we do reserve, you know, 10, 15 million for, for additional follow on financing. Um, are because we focus on three sectors as well, environment, 
broadly defined as one of those three sectors. We don't have any quotas or, or specific allocations to any of those three sectors. We're very opportunistic. Um, and so we're, we're looking for the best companies to come our way to be able to deploy capital. I think I'm, I'm at the 10 minute mark, so I'll stop there. Okay, no, that's, that's perfect. Thanks, thanks for the quick overview. I guess, um, you know, first, first question, um, and, and maybe this applies more to the Series A fund, can, can you just talk a bit about your pipeline? You know, mm -hmm. how, are you, how are you sourcing uh, so many, so many good, good deals? Yeah, so um, a bit of a, a longer answer to that. So um, we, we source deals for the most part in the same way that everybody else does. So this is coming through our co-investors, through our existing entrepreneur network, through our limited partners, through um, other people that have been in and around City Light for, for a long time and know what it is that we do. Um, we also, uh, about two years ago, one of my partners built out a data, um, it, internally we call it the machine, which is uh, just goes to show that we're not very creative when it comes to names, but it's effectively a code that's been written to scrape places like Crunchbase, um, TechCrunch, news websites, SEC filings, patent filings, anything that is indicative of like a new company has been created this machine scrapes that, identifies keywords that we have figured out over time. These are the type of keywords that companies that get into the portfolio or in further down the pipeline are using. And we funnel those directly into our CRM. And it's basically it can pull from a news article that this company was just interviewed because they are working on carbon capture technology. That might be something that you wanna take a look at. And we can pipe that directly in. And that means in a lot of cases, we're actually doing the cold outreach to the company. And so it's an interesting kind of reversal of roles for, for a lot of entrepreneurs to be getting the email from a venture capital fund that says, hey, we found you on the internet. Would you be open to talking? Okay, okay. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't know if this is available or not, but from a, from a portfolio level, are there any impact stats that you, can, that you could share with us? Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. If you go to our website, we do have an overall infographic around um, what our portfolio has accomplished in terms of education, environment, and safety and care. Um, we don't share data on the company level because um, unless a company is public, because generally they consider that proprietary information. Um, but most of that can be found on our website. Okay. Um, and maybe, you know, going back to climate change, since that's a, a major focus, uh, for you, can you, you know, w without necessarily identifying the company by name, could you maybe describe for us so, some of the best climate change investment ideas that, that, that you've come across? Ooh, that is really hard. Okay. Um, there, there's one that we use as the example of um, kind of something that fits our thesis very uh, completely to a T because it's, it's easy enough for my grandmother to understand. And so I'll use that as the example. Um, it's a company called Ohm Connect. And so Ohm Connect is a um, residential demand response provider. They're one of the only residential demand response providers and they're primarily in California at the moment. Um, but what the business does, and I, I will ask them to forgive me in advance for simplifying it down to this, but they effectively tie into any IOT device in your home and are able to make it responsive to the grid. And so at times of peak demand, when the only way to increase supply is to turn on peaker plants and create more carbon emissions, they actually can go to residential customers and say, the grid is about to experience peak demand. If you turn down your HVAC or you turn off charging your electric vehicle, or you even just turn off your light that's on that smart plug, we're gonna be able to pay you based on the savings that the grid experiences. And we take a small revenue cut of that but we only get paid if you reduce your energy usage, which means we only get paid if there is the carbon footprint and, and kind of climate change piece aligned with your action. Um, and so just in the last couple of months, and I would encourage people to go, to go look this up, um, the, the wildfires and the extreme heat in California were causing the grid to effectively break. There were blackouts, there were brownouts, um, and in a lot of cases, the grid was looking to own connect to prevent that from happening because they were able to go to residential customers and say, basically, you can have a blackout or you can turn your air conditioning down by two degrees for an hour and we'll all survive this. And it worked. 
And so it's something that I think, unfortunately, we start seeing a lot more of that like hyperbolic situation, but um, something where Ohm Connect, especially with the prolifer proliferation of the smart home could have absolutely outsized impact in the coming years. That's great. Um, okay, we're gonna have to move on, but uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you.